Hi and welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to continue talking about the Tektronix 5 series. This is, of course, the MSO 5.8 with eight analog channels. When this instrument was originally released, I did a video about it, talking about all the new ways Tektronix is thinking about building their future oscilloscopes. Brand new GUI, interface, functionality, and capability with their own ASIC, both in the front end and on the digitization and the acquisition board. And we'll show you that. And I want to show you what's inside this unit. I have the acquisition board, so we'll take a look at a teardown of that and talk about the technology that's gone into it. And since the original video, I've had this on my bench now for some time, and it's kind of become my favorite unit. Uh, the reason is because, of course, it has eight analog channels and the combination of the flex channels being able to switch between analog and digital, very fast, a GUI, and very intuitive use. And it's, you know, quite nice on the bench. So that's why it's been sitting on my repair bench. But yesterday, they released a new firmware releasing a brand new feature of these instruments called Spectrum View on each of the analog channels. That's a really powerful tool, and it's something that's been built into the ASIC architecture ahead of time. It's now essentially been released, and I believe it's freely available to anyone who owns the, spo uh, the scope. So I'm really excited to show you what it can do. And of course, uh, the teardown is going to also tell you a little bit about the architecture, uh, architecture of the instrument, and we're going to see some of the new capabilities of Spectrum View and see what it can do for us. So let's go take a look at what's inside the unit and do some experiments. So let's go ahead and take a look at the acquisition board for the Tektronic MSO5 series. Now this is a completely custom board, and on top of that, it has custom ASICs on it. It's pretty expensive for vendors to roll out their own ASICs for oscilloscopes because there are so many good a to D converters on the market. But if you want to bring differentiation and perform some unique functions directly in, into your instrument, you're going to have to roll out your own IC. And of course, this is what Tech has done. And this whole board is based on their own custom IC. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Now remember, I don't have a block diagram or schematic or anything. I'm reverse engineering this uh, as, as you and I are looking at it. But it's always interesting to see if we can figure out how they thought about doing the instrument. Now there's a lot of components here, but as with any analog to digital converter based system or any oscilloscope, there are some primary blocks you should look out for. There's going to be a PLL section that generates the clock for the A to D converters. This is critical. Not only does it synchronize multiple time interleaved analog to digital converters across multiple channels, but the jitter and the performance of this PLL is crucial for maintaining the effective number of bits. Jitter on the clock basically destroys your ENOP. Uh, there's going to be some kind of an FPGA, and indeed there is one over here. Uh, this ario 5 FPGA seems to be connected to a bunch of memory over here and interfacing to other peripherals, taking care of the PCI Express, taking care of the PLL, but it's not involved in memory acquisition because it looks like every one of these ICs is paired with, their own, with its own memory, so the data can be dumped directly to, their own, to its own memory. There is some mystery going on over here. We'll talk about that in a second. There are a whole bunch of DC-DC converter modules. These are nice, vertically mounted. They're all identical. Uh, these kind of ASICs and FPGAs require a wide range of voltages from many different power supplies. And of course, that's what these are for. And they filter them and condition them appropriately. And this is pretty tricky to do, especially for data converter circuits. Uh, the signal coming from the PLL is routed all over the place. And there are a lot of um, uh, microwave components directly on the PCB to condition the clock to get it ready for the ASICs. And I'll talk about that once we take a close look at it. But really, you have data converters and memory next to each other and FPGA taking care of everything else. Then the mystery is here in the middle. It's obvious that this thing can be equipped with more sockets for more memory. Uh, but interestingly enough, they're obviously not there. But what makes it weird is that this interposer you see here looks like to be something you drop onto the board to maintain some interconnectivity if this chip here is not populated, to maintain some kind of a, a potential connection between the channels or routing some digital stuff through that needs a chip in its place. I don't know why it is not there. Does this instrument support some memory that requires hardware upgrade? What is exactly happening here? Uh, interestingly enough, I don't think this thing receives any analog voltages, meaning that probably is only involved in some kind of memory uh, acquisition, computation, or something, but it's not there, and they're just uh, an interposer there in its place. Obviously, this has to be there for make the whole thing, to make the whole thing work. It does indeed receive clock, but I don't see any data going into it or any analog data going into it. So it's really, really interesting. On the other side of the board, we're going to have connectors which interface to the front of the instrument where the flex channel and the BNC connectors and the uh, logical inputs go into it. We'll talk about that, but unfortunately, I don't have that board, so we can't look at that. Uh, but nonetheless, we can see what it looks like to pass the data through. 
Everything else looks pretty self-explanatory. Nothing unusual really going on. We have to dig a little bit deeper to see how they condition the PLL clock and what is happening with these uh, analog channels. And we'll look at it the other side of the board as well. But overall, looks pretty interesting. And here is the back of the board. No surprises here. You can see we have four high-speed connectors here. These are dual connectors. These are the type of, I believe they're made by Semtec, the type of connectors that can pass both uh, high-speed, analog, digital, and power supply uh, signals around. These are fairly common in these type of uh, devices and many applications in telecom. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight channels. So the analog data is certainly going through here. And the front panel acquisition of the digital uh, capture is also handled through these connectors, I believe. Uh, we see two big chips here. These are um, Texas Instrument ICs designed for DCDC converter control up to four channels at a time. One, two, three, four here, and one, two, three, and four there. So these chips control all the DCDC converters. Four independent rails all being controlled at the same time. Here's the back of the FPGA with all the decoupling capacitors. Here's the back of one of the HD converter acquisition I see. Here's the other one, and here's the one that's blank. And you can see none of the capacitors are populated. Now, this mystery is still a little bit there, but the more I look at it, it seems like this is somehow involved in extra acquisition memory. Uh, there is some high-speed signal coming out of it. It goes into two connectors which are not populated, which is also interesting. This is a differential line, and perhaps some clock signal co going out for uh, passing into some other device, I'm not sure. It could be that this is the same board that's used in the low profile version of this instrument that's a little bit different, but it's still a mystery. But nonetheless, this connection to the memory and the fact that it receives the clock uh, kind of tells us that it must be involved somewhere, somewhere in some kind of acquisition. But anyway, no analog going through it, so that makes it quite a bit more interesting. Uh, now, this could be an analog signal potentially going into it, but I don't think so. I think it's more of an output. But either way, it looks nice at the back. You can see all the high-speed lines going to the FPGA for the PCI Express, and some more components for the PLL here. So let's go and take a look at the PLL a little bit. You know what? I see another connector here, right here, with these two connected. I wonder, ah, you know what this could be? This could be the dedicated channel for external trigger, where the low-profile version does have. Uh, but this one doesn't. I wonder if that's what this is, because this, this is another one of these connectors over here. It's just half, half of one, not a full one. And this allows you to uh, potentially interact with the entire acquisition system through this channel. I wonder if that's what that is for. So let's take a look at some of the signal distribution on this board, uh, analog and RF and everything else, and let's see what is going on here. So here we have the core of the PLL. Now I have taken the cover off so you can see, you can see the cage around it, and it's the opening where all the signals come out, the top layer, and we can analyze it and see what's going on. So here we have an analog devices or a Hittite VCO. This is a 5.8 to 6.8 gigahertz VCO, very good phase noise, uh, particularly good for instrumentation. And uh, that is going to be the signal generation, of course. Now you need a PLL, a fraction and PLL. There's one over here that's also an analog device's Hittite part. The signal from the VCO has to get to the fraction and PLL. And you can see that it goes over here and it's fed into a Wilkinson power splitter. And the two outputs of the Wilkinson go into two other Wilkinson power splitters. And one of the outputs of that fits all the way back all the way over here and back into here. So that's how they close the loop. And the other outputs are used, of course, for the rest of the circuit. So if you follow this output and then follow this one, you can see that this one is split into two yet again, and they all three of them go into three amplifiers. Now, one of them is not populated. It's just basically boost the signal back up again uh, so they can be sent on their way. Now, these are most likely going to be 6.25 gigahertz signals. This is a 6.25 giga sample per second instrument. The VCO is right in the middle uh, of those frequencies, so that kind of makes sense. And there's going to be multiple versions of it because, again, you need to create a, 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 all these time interleave ADCs are going to need their own clocks. Now, the internal architecture of the analog to digital converter is not known. It's obviously a mystery, but you can see a little bit about uh, from what's going on, what they're doing. So let's follow, this is not populated. That goes into that middle uh, IC that's, that's open. Uh, so we're going to we're going to take a look at it, but it's not going to really have anything to do with the acquisition. So let's see if we follow one of these. Let's follow the top one, and if I continue over here, you can see that we can follow that signal around. Uh, where did it go? There it is. Over here, it goes over here, and it goes over here. This is probably yet another amplifier. I think these are identical. I believe their amplifiers are at least some kind of a gain control device. There's some filter over here to get rid of potential harmonics that are not needed, and then a bunch of other signal 
uh, splitting happens again. So they split the signal into two over here, and you can see that when they split it over two, they send it over here to a single length to differential conversion. It's just a balance. And then you get a differential clock fed into here. But interestingly enough, the other side of the splitter goes into a branch line coupler, which would give you a quadrature signal, 0 and 90 degrees. And they pass those two signals again to two single and two differential conversions to other balance, which means that you're going to get a quadrature signal on these four lines, 0 degree, 90, 180, 270, all appearing on these. So they have the ability to drive this with a quadrature signal or directly with a the main signal. That's interesting. Now I would have thought that if you're going to drive a bit quadrature, you wouldn't want it to be at 6.25 gigahertz anymore. Although if you have quadrature combined with this and you might be running all the channels and this each of these is going to have to have four data converters in it and they have to be synchronized and I'm a little bit curious to see what, what they're doing exactly in there. But again, I don't know what's on the IC, but you can kind of tell what's happening based on how the signals are divided. Now they do exactly the same thing on the other channel as well. And if you look carefully, you can see two inputs. Here's one. There's a tiny anti-aliasing filter in the front over here. There's another one. There's another tiny anti-aliasing filter. And these go into the board on the other side into the Semtec connectors that I showed you that interface to the front panel. So here's two of the eight analog inputs on the other side. Here's another one, here's another one. They go into the chip as well. So each of these has four analog inputs. And I know that when you turn all the channels on, I believe the data, the sampling drops to 3.25 gigahertz sample per second, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm going to check it again once I turn it on. It's been a while since I, I had all eight channels on at the same time. But I believe that's what happens. So then this must be capable of dividing the signals further. Because if you divide two quadrature signals uh, by a factor of two again, then you get a nice you know, eight phases out of it potentially. So there's lots of interesting things you can do with that, and I believe that's what's going on. I think what they're doing is that if it's running at full rate, they use this clock, and if it's running at half rate with all the channels, they divide these again and run all the ADCs based on those. That's kind of my guess. So let's go ahead a little bit further and see that dummy interposer. What's going on with that? You can see the dummy interposer receives no analog signal, but receives an identical clock uh, as the ADCs themselves. And there's some stuff written over here, mostly has to do with triggering, which reinforces my initial idea that this is a triggering IC, which unfortunately does not seem to be doing anything on this model because it doesn't have a dedicated trigger input, but the low profile version does. Uh, but exactly the same stuff happening here. So, and if I go all the way to the other side, you can see the same issue again. Uh, what do we have? Here's an, one analog input, another analog input. Here's one, and here's one. Therefore, this one and the other one are identical. Uh, same branch line coupler, same splitter. Very nice. So I like it. Lots of microwave engineering. That's what I like to see. There's no such thing as digital circuits anymore. Of course, everything is mixed signal, and everything is beautiful. Now, you don't see all the traces. There are tons of, in some lighting conditions, you might see some. There are tons of traces running uh, from the IC to the memory, to be expected, of course, because that's how you would interface with this kind of uh, DDRAM, DDR memory of some kind that's over here. I don't know if this is custom, but it looks like a, a typical DRAM module there. So looks very cool. So now that we have some idea about how it works, I think it might be good to go and do some experiment with it. I'm really excited to see this new spectrum view they have. And now that you see what's going on inside, it will make some more sense when we use the instrument. Well, here is our setup. Let's go and see what's going on here. So obviously, I'm looking at a signal on channel 1 that's jumping all over the place. And I'm interested in understanding what's actually happening to this signal. Now, this is coming from a synthesizer. And of course, as with any synthesizer, when you have a signal varying like that, a good place to look at it is in the spectrum domain. But you also need correlation with the time domain, because these are mixed signal devices. They have digital interfaces, and they're putting out RF signals. And you want to look at these all at the same time. When I was reviewing the Tektronix MDOs, the mixed domain oscilloscopes, those instruments are a champion at looking at multiple domains at the same time and time correlating them. That's the strength of those instruments. Now, with the spectrum view, with the Tektronix 5 series, you might be able to do something similar. And I want to explore that possibility and see how it works and if that capability is now essentially available on the 5 series oscilloscope. So we're looking at the signal on channel 1. I also have a probe connected to channel 2, which allows me to look at digital signals or analog signals or whatever else I need to do. In this case, we're going to look at some digital IOs going into our PLL. Now, there's another problem. The PLL I'm using is at 6 gigahertz. The MSO5 series is a 2 gigahertz oscilloscope, meaning that the signal is outside of its bandwidth. But I can use an external mixer to bring the signal down within the bandwidth of the Tektronix 5 series and then analyze it directly on that. 
that's not too difficult to do, but I think tech should make instruments like that to allow them to easily be interfaced to the 5 series and 6 series scopes and use them for this type of analysis. Right now I'm just using some external mixers and I will show it to you. There are some oscilloscopes and spectrum analyzers from other vendors which can be interconnected like that quite simply and you can use the MSO 5 series and 6 series of course with any other vendor. You don't have to just use it with Tektronix instruments. I, I like to mix and match whatever that works best. So let's take a look and see what I have on my setup. So on the right side here I have a board and this board is actually a Hittite PLL as an analog device as PLL, and it's controlled with this USB digital interface, which is an SBI converter. There's a reference and multiple chipsets, VCO, fractional, and synthesizer, and that puts out an RF signal. That RF signal is roughly around 6 gigahertz. I'm putting it through a MyTech down convert mixer, and the LO from this mixer is coming from my Keyside EXG. So the Keyside EXG is set to 5.8 gigahertz, which means that if I have a 6 gigahertz PLO, we're going to get an IF signal of roughly around 200 megahertz, which is well within the band with analysis of the 5 series scope. That's perfect. So then I take that out and I amplify it using a little mini circuits amplifier, or I think that's a picoseconds lab amplifier. And that is then fed, of course, to channel 1 of the scope right over there. And there's a computer on the other side uh, that is doing all the programming. There are various power supplies over there. There's a Keith Lee power supply, which is one of my favorite ones, uh, that is powering the, the PLL. And there's another Azure and power supply over there, powering the amplifier. So the whole setup's really nicely uh, working. That just the only problem is we want to understand what's happening over here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the screen here. And I'm going to capture it digitally because I don't think filming it is very good. We're going to look at it on a, on a different computer over there. And then we're going to analyze it using the software and nothing else, just this instrument, see how much information we can extract from the behavior of the signal and what can we understand about how this PLL is doing whatever it's doing. So let's go take a look. So let's go ahead and take a look at the signal on channel 1. So right now channel 1 is set to 200 millivolt per division, 50 ohms, 2 gigahertz of bandwidth, which is the highest bandwidth this instrument gives you per channel. And you can see the sample rate is 6.25 gigahertz sample per second, capturing 2.5 kilo points. And this is clearly a signal that's jumping between two frequencies. You can clearly see two different tones, and its behavior is random. The time it spends between the two frequencies is not always the same. We don't know anything about the frequency. We want to analyze it. But more importantly, we want to see how it changes from one frequency to another and what it is that triggers this change in frequency and how much time it takes between the trigger point and actual settling of the frequency. These are pretty difficult questions to answer if you want to do a computation directly on the instrument. Well, the easiest thing we can do is to just do some basic measurement on it. Well, this instrument has, a, of course, a rich set of measurements that are built into it, some which are options you can purchase, like jitter and power and the DDR analysis, which are shown up here. Perhaps I'll do a video about doing some of those analysis uh, different, uh, at a different time. For now, let's just go ahead and do a simple time measurement. Let's do a measurement frequency. You can see you get a nice GUI view here of what it is measuring. I'm going to add that. Let's get rid of this, and there it is. You can see we're measuring the frequency, and it says 200 megahertz or 150 megahertz. Because the reason for that is because depending on where we are triggering, which is random, uh, we are going to either capture the 200 megahertz cycle or 150 megahertz cycle, and the vertical lines here show you where it's doing that computation for making the measurement. Okay, that's great, but that doesn't really tell us that much. Well, the next thing we can do is take an FFT of it. Now, the problem with taking an FFT on a scope is that the instrument uses the same sample it's using for time domain, which is what you're looking at, to do FFT computation. The problem is that means that these two are going to be tied together. As you change your horizontal settings, your FFT settings will change with it. Unless you have a huge amount of memory, you dump everything into memory and then compute after. This also means that this computation is done sequentially and possibly done on the CPU, which means that it's going to slow the instrument down unless you have dedicated FFT hardware. Now what they've done here with Spectrum View is something quite different. Instead of getting all the samples for time, they actually break the A to D converter samples into two. And they take some samples for time and they take some samples for frequency computation and do that sequentially back and forth. Let's see what happens when I turn it on. And you'll see the advantage right away. So if I go here on the channel one, I can go ahead and enable Spectrum View. Now have an eye out here. You can see the horizontal sample rate is 6.25 because sample per second. When I turn it on, jumps to 3.125 gigasample per second. Because on this horizontal division that we have, the instrument is using some of the samples or every other sample potentially to do FFT calculation. 
Now, the instrument does this in hardware, which is critical, which means that the decimation and the digital down conversion required to produce the spectrum view is done as part of the architecture of the chipset, and therefore it is super fast and completely independent of what you see in the time domain. I can do anything I want here on the time domain and it will have no effect on the spectrum, which is a huge advantage. And not only that, it is time correlated to the other channel, which is basically what the mixed domain oscilloscope does in the other class of instrument Tektronic has, but this is just so much faster overall. Uh, it has some disadvantages compared to the MDO because you're using, of course, some of the samples, but nonetheless, it is significantly faster. And you have eight channels, so you can do that on eight different channels, which is huge. So having said that, let's take a look at this. Now, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us there's two frequencies. We were expecting that, of course. We see a frequency 150 megahertz. We see a frequency 200 megahertz is randomly jumping back and forth between two of them. We also see a third tone here, which is 300 megahertz. That's the second harmonic of the 150 megahertz, which is showing in band right now. And this is generated primarily in the amplifier that's following the baseband, and some of it is, uh, is done on the IF part of the mixer itself. It's just nonlinearity, that doesn't really matter. Let's go into the spectrum view and see what kind of settings we have. Well, we can change the center frequency. We can put the center frequency anyway to anywhere up to the maximum frequency of the instrument itself, so all the way up to 2 gigahertz. We're looking at 175 megahertz. Now the span for which you can do analysis on, on this instrument is limited to 312.5 megahertz, which is of course a multiple of 3.125 gigasample per second. So I can't go any higher than that. But I can go lower. Let's go at it a little bit lower. Let's look at a 100 megahertz window. That's nice because the two tones we're interested in fit exactly in that. You can do different kinds of windowing. I'm using Blackman Harris. All of these different type of windows, you know, rectangular hamming, handing, flat top, these all have specific uh, consequences between the time to frequency duality and depending on how the spectrum expands and how many tones you get and what kind of power distribution you have between the tones that's all mathematical and of course I'm choosing a 1000 to 1 span to resolution bandwidth and that setting is also pretty important and I'll show you why so there it is we're looking at these at the same time but now I want to look at more of the time domain I want to see what happens to the frequency domain well we can try it let's go ahead zoom out and check it out, it has absolutely no effect. I can do whatever I want on the time domain. It has no impact on the speed and on how the spectrum is viewed, which is of course very important. But what is on top of it, probably the, the most important feature here is this yellow rectangle you see at the bottom. This yellow rectangle represents the amount of time correlated to channel one where this spectrum up here is computed. But what is amazing is I can move this around. If I want to capture it over here, let's say, I can put this anywhere I want and the instrument will recompute the FFT internally in hardware for this duration of time. This is important because that's how time correlation works. That's how you can correlate the spectrum to an event in the time domain on channel 1. So this is all nice and great but the problem with this is that, let me go ahead and do a single capture here. I can move this around and you can see the FFT gets computed live as I move this around. By the way, this happens faster on the instrument. I'm actually limited by frame capture on my capture card here. So then the instrument is even more smooth than this. But as you can see, within this capture window, there is absolutely no jump. All of it is 150 megahertz, which means I did not catch a point where the frequency shifts between these two. Well, that's kind of not very good. It doesn't help us at all. If I do another capture, let's say, I still caught the same one. Let me see if I can catch a second one. Now I'm going to try this for two days and I'm never going to be able to do it. There it is. There's a second one. Now, but the problem is that now in this capture window, I only have the second one, which means that I need a different signal to be able to capture and trigger on in order to, to be able to find out exactly when this transition happens. And then I can move the window around and get even more information. Well, I can easily do this. Let's go ahead and add another channel. I have the other channel sitting on the data of the SPI bus that's sending commands to this PLL chip to change the frequency between these two points. Let's go ahead and enable channel two. And I'm going to do a continuous capture. There it is, there's our channel two. Uh, now we don't see anything on it right now because we're not triggering on channel two, but we need to change the trigger setting because I, whenever this is, I'm just capturing some random window, of course, that doesn't mean there's gonna be some digital activity here. So I have to change my trigger. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's change the trigger from channel one to channel two. There it is. Now I'm correlating. Let me change this uh, trigger to it's already at 1.4 volt. Perfect. There it is. So I'm triggering right over here. This is my vertical 
a trigger point and you can see every once in a while I'm getting some digital command and now the spectrum looks unsurprisingly different because I'm triggering it and I'm showing this window you see this window is bigger than the SPI command itself meaning that I am doing an FFT computation sometimes at the correct point in the SPI communication when the frequency is actually changing. And that's what I want to trigger on. So not every FFT computation is of interest, only some of them are. So let's do a couple of different ones. Let me do another one. Let me see, there it is. So here's one, this one is obviously making a change in frequency. There it is. Let me do another one. I should do single capture anyway, not like this, but that's okay. There it is. Okay, so this event on the SPI has no impact on the, S on the frequency, which means that this is not that is something of interest. I can go ahead and move this window around. You can see before this event and after this event, we are at the same frequency. But if I capture a different event, like this one, and check it out, that's exactly what I want to capture. Before it, the frequency is 200 megahertz, and after it, the frequency is 150 megahertz. So we have caught precisely the kind of event we are looking for that we want to trigger on. Let's zoom into it and see if it has any unique characteristic. Now, there is much more fancy things you can do here. I'm doing it this the easiest way. I can just capture this as a digital bit sequence of the SPI command, trigger on a particular word on the SPI and be done with it. But if I don't want to go through that problem and I'm only looking at one line and I don't want to decode this, I'm looking at this and I'm like, wait a minute, this looks like that this has a wide pulse. So why don't I change my trigger to trigger on a wider pulse instead? So let's go to this and run this. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to change my trigger from edge to pulse width and I'm going to trigger only when the pulse is larger than one microsecond right over here and check it out that's exactly what we want to see so it's now always triggering on this event and this is the kind of event we want to see let me zoom out even further go all the way let's say is this good enough yeah this is good enough well, you can do a single capture it really doesn't matter by the way, this, the reason this is running slowly is not, is not because the instrument is computing anything. It's because this event that you're seeing here happens very rarely. That's why this is triggering slowly. It has nothing to do with the, the instrument itself. So I'm going to do a single capture. Actually, no, forget it. Let's just, let me show you how, how it works even when you do, do a single capture. So I'm all the way up out here. All the way out here. The frequency is 150 megahertz. I'm going to take this window, I'm going to slide it all the way to the left. All the way le at the left here, the frequency is 200 megahertz. Interestingly, this thing has some quantized spots it likes to stick to. I can't just put this anywhere I want, it looks like. It's a little bit it's interesting. I wonder if it has to do with the setting of the spectrum and the number of points he has to capture. But anyway, so you can see over here, we're at one frequency, and over here, we are at a different frequency. And then right in the middle is our transition. And of course, this huge spectrum content that you see here is a function of the entire frequency content when the PLR switches from one setting to another setting. So what can I do with this? Well, why don't I go ahead and do a single capture? And let's see, let's move it slowly from before and see how the spectrum changes as I slide this window forward. Check it out. We're reaching the SPI command we're going to hit the SPI command. The PLR is changing frequency. You got tons of frequency content because of the transition. And then we pass it forward and the PLL finally settles down. But guess what I can do? I can find out how long it takes the PLL to completely settle down. I can take this and move it. Well, it hasn't settled down here. And let's see, is it settled here? Yeah, it looks like right, right around here. This is what I mean, I don't understand why this snaps and doesn't let me just leave it wherever I want to leave it. It's an interesting thing. I wonder if it has to do with some other setting. Anyway, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes right now. It's okay. So this tells me that after the falling edge of this data on the SPI bus, it takes roughly about 20 microseconds for the PLL to change from one frequency to another. Now this could be a misleading conclusion because we don't know how many other clock cycles there are and we don't know if the rest of these bits are zeros. So that doesn't tell us how much latency the PLL has. It just tells us that from this falling edge, you have to wait this much time before the PLL settles down. If I were to trigger on the clock, all the clock cycles are the same. So I will not be able to do what I'm doing with the pulse width and the triggering, but I will be able to count, for example, the number of cycles that are there. 
Nonetheless, this is already pretty useful. This tells me that this is how much time it takes for the PLL to settle down. This kind of measurement on a normal oscilloscope is very hard to do because you're going to have to find these points with FFTs and it, this just makes it so much easier, so much simpler. And of course, if I go ahead and go back to running this, I'm just going to go back to doing this uh, computation and doing the triggering on this point just like before. And if I move this a little further, let me just put it here. I don't think it likes to go all the way out there, so let me let me zoom out a little bit more because once I do that, there you go, now I'm at 50 microseconds. So I should be able to, in theory, bring it all the way here. Yep, at 40 microseconds we are okay, moving it a little bit closer, and right there we are getting to a point where, yep, there it is, you can see it. So if I leave it over here, this tells me that the frequency hasn't completely settled down. It just means that within this window, I have the transition from one frequency to another frequency. So now I hope that you can appreciate uh, the benefit of being able to do this kind of measurements. Now there's tons and tons of other things we can do. We can turn this into a complete analysis of very complex spectrum problems that you don't expect tones that just come and go. You don't know where they're coming from. You want to find a correlation. You have eight channels to do this on, which is quite powerful. And how about this absolute craziness? So here I have all eight channels enabled and they're capturing 10 microseconds worth of data and I'm doing spectrum view on all eight channels simultaneously. And of course, there is no slowing down whatsoever because this is all done in parallel, it's done in the ASICs themselves. It's magnificent. I mean, you, the amount of computations going on here is crazy. And of course, we have time correlation to spectrum on all the channels simultaneously to each other and to their spectrum. And you can do advanced triggering on all the channels and get all kind of interesting uh, data coming out of this. Of course, if you want to add digital channels here, you're going to have to disable some of these analog channels because these are flex channels, as I said earlier. And that means that you're going to lose some of them if you want to bring digital in. But if you bring digital in, you still maintain a complete synchronization between the spectrum domain and time domain and uh, between all the other channels just as well so it doesn't really change anything from that point of view now there are limitations here of course uh, one of them being that this thing is doing digital down conversion and you can do it uh, on a window as big as 312 and a half megahertz which is what it is doing in all the channels simultaneously you don't have to lock all the center frequencies on all the channels together of course but the maximum analysis window you have on this particular model is 312 and a half megahertz the other limitation i see which is something i hope they change if it is possible within the architecture of the system is that i don't see a way of triggering on the spectrum itself uh, I don't see that option here and I think that's really really important because you can trigger on a, on a spectral event as opposed to a time domain event and then that I hope it is possible but I could not find it because you can see here I cannot select uh, any difference between the kind of triggers that are done here so that is a limitation that uh, I wonder if it is possible to solve at some point or at least I can't find it if it is possible to do. Other than that, uh, the tool is really valuable. And I think the Spectrum View, which is a unique Tektronics uh, architecture, I believe, I, I haven't seen it anywhere else, is quite nice and powerful. And I hope that you can do more interesting things with it. And we're going to do other videos in the future showing some of the other uh, capabilities of these instruments. And I'm sure the Spectrum View is going to come in handy. This is, again, one of the reasons why uh, this is my kind of default repair oscilloscope because of uh, some of the advanced features it has. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this uh, continued look at the Tektronix 5 series. It's a really nice scope, of course. Now, it has some limitations. Uh, for instance, this instrument really shines when it has all the eight channels. The reason is because if you start to use the flex channels and occupy one of the analog channels to do digital, analysis, uh, if you only have a four channel on the scope, which means you're going to lose one of those channels So because you have to have the MSO functionality, for example. So doing the uh, some digital would block one of the analog channels, and that's a limitation. I wish they had a probe that would allow you to just switch between analog and digital without having to unplug and replug the probe. Uh, that would be another advantage, of course, by changing that. Now, the low profile version of this, as I spoke earlier, has the extra trigger input, uh, but this instrument doesn't, which means that Again, the eight channel is the most beneficial one because if you need a dedicated trigger, you're gonna have to use one of the analog channels. So that's another thing that could be certainly improved. But the MSO6 series has some of those improvements in it. That's a four channel scope, of course, with a lot more bandwidth. But it's a really wonderful oscilloscope. And as you saw, the Spectrum View is a powerful tool that was built into the integrated circuit ahead of time. So I'm really uh, happy to see that that's been released. 
other than that, really, it's hard to find fault with it. Like I said, it is one of my favorite scopes. And if you happen to buy one of these because of the video, because you're watching my reviews of it, I'll let them know that you did that. It doesn't really benefit me in any other way than having a good relationship with them, which allows me to continue to work with them, bring you state-of-the-art equipment, take them apart, show you what's inside, do some really industry relevant and research relevant experiments with them to show you what you can do with it, which I hope you enjoyed. Well, I'll see you in the comment section.